what we're trying to do, so I'm, I don't know if you know me like at all, I'm David Hooks, I do uh, some politics videos, I've not done any for a while, uh, and I do online stuff with uh, Twitter and, and blogging and stuff. Uh, so what I'm trying to do at the moment is get a piece together on fishing in Scotland, the fishing industry, and how we only ever hear about one part of it and one from one set of voices. Yeah, yeah. And that's been true up until, I would say, fairly recently, um, the last few weeks. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what it is your organisation is, what it does and who it represents. Um, well, our organisation is the Communities Inshore Fisheries Alliance. Uh, we were set up in December 2016 to look at the issues of the inshore fishing fleet or the coastal fishing fleet. Um, we are an amalgamation of a number of fishing associations, including my own, which is the Clyde Fishermen's Association, the Western Isles Fishermen's Association, Orkney Fishermen's Association, mm -hmm. Galloway Fishermen's Association, <laughs> yep. Dunbar and various others around the coast. Okay. And this is all, so this is within the, the 12 mile limit of fishing, is this correct? Um, not entirely. I mean, we most of our boats will fish within 12 miles, a lot of them will, but we do have some larger boats as well, but they're generally the boats that are have the strongest links to the coastal communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the average kind of person, I mean, certainly before I started looking into this, I had no idea what demersal or pelagic fishing even meant, or, or that there even were two different types. Can you maybe explain to people a little bit about what the different types of fishing are and why you need, for example, larger boats for some and smaller boats for others? Yeah, of course I can. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you get the, the bigger pelagic vessels, which are the ones that generally leave from the northeast, um, and they catch mackerel and herring, um, other pelagic stocks like that. You get the boats that also leave generally from the, the northeast, which are the white fish boats, which go after haddock, um, cod, those types of fish, um, which are considered white fish. Then you have the inshore boats, and most of them now um, are, are, are targeting shellfish. Now, some of them will go to, to thin fish as well, but they don't have much quota for that. Yeah. Um, so by and large, they, they're, they're fishing uh, nephrops, scallops, uh, crab, lobsters, those types of things. Okay. So the, 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 the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, which is what most people hear of whenever they hear about fishing in Scotland, they represent around eight organisations. Now, do they organisations all agree on everything? Are they, are they, is this one voice that we hear coming from them? Uh, united or is this something where there's perhaps different factions within it? I, I, do you hear any other information within the community? Um, well obviously CIFA is a different body from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. We mm. were previously members of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation as Clyde Fishermen's Association and we left in November 2017 um, largely because we felt our interests could be better represented out with the body. Okay. Um, that was our personal thoughts. Um, of course, fishermen don't always agree and different fishing associations won't always agree on all yeah. policies. Um, but it depends really, I think, within the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, you can speak to them about their structure, but they have a voting structure um, and you can buy seats. So I guess, I guess the more seats you have, the better chance you have of, of getting your policy through. Okay. Um, now, another thing that that I kind of wanted to ask is we, we often hear about the hated CFP, the Common Fisheries Policy. Now, I've done a, a little bit of research myself to see what it is and, and how it works, but to, to the layman, could you explain roughly what, this, what the CFP actually is, maybe some of its good points and some of the bad points as you see them? Yeah, and, and that's I'm glad you asked me that because we've always tried to look at the good and the bad um, of any scenario. With the Common Fisheries Policy, it was established when we went into um, into Europe. And at that time, we had common grazing rights with about eight other countries, I believe. So eight other countries could, fa could fish our waters and we could fish theirs. Um, as the European Union developed, um, it came to the point where there was obviously 28 countries. Um, about half of them who didn't have a sea um, board who were accessing waters as well. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously that changes the pressures that, that are on the stocks as so well. There's no, so there's no reciprocal fishing there because they don't have any waters within for which to fish. So they're simply fishing in our waters and with almost kind of nothing in return other than access to their markets, presumably. 
Well, the, the, yeah, that's true to a certain point. But I mean, I guess there's there's not a lot of kind of inshore uh, inland countries that would have a massive fishing fleet anyway. Um, but what it would mean is, is obviously when it comes to votes again on certain policies, if, if continental Europe were lobbying their partners, um, certain decisions could be put through that maybe wouldn't suit everyone um, who had a seaboard. So, yeah, there were issues. It wasn't so much that, that everyone from landlocked countries were, were fishing in um, Scotland, but, but there certainly were issues. Um, I think the controversy over the CFP, I mean, if I can give you an example, um, in the Western Isles, uh, in Stornoway, I think over 85% of the catch pre-1974 was whitefish, um, finfish. Um, right. And now it's 1%. So, oh. yeah, the, the massive. Now, the CFP will have something to do with that. But also... Is that to do with quotas or is that to do with the, the, the amount of fish that are there to actually take out? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to, no, it's to do with quotas. I was going to say, it, the CFP will have something to do with that in the sense that there will be more foreign boats that are accessing the quotas, etc. Oh, it's a lot yeah. to do with domestic policy as well, what section of the fleet the, the quota has went to. Um, so it's, it's a mix of both. I mean, I think most of our men understood that regardless of what happened in Brexit, there would be access to, to foreign boats to some extent. They probably did. They, they they probably didn't foresee it being the same as it has been. Mm -hmm. um, I had a text at quarter past three in the morning from really cold, tired, wet fishermen saying, "I can't catch a box of monkfish." Yet there's right. uh, twenty one Arctic lorries going from Lochinver to to Spain or France, and that was difficult for them to watch, even for sustainability. Yeah. So that was a problem, but it. You know, it, it was more about sorting out the levels of access and making it a little bit fairer. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the uh, complaints that I've heard from Bertie Armstrong a couple of times is that uh, in, in UK waters, he, he doesn't specifically mention Scottish waters, that 64% of the, the overall quota goes to the UK and around 40% goes elsewhere, whereas in independent coastal nations, as he calls them, like, for example, Norway, etc., that's around 80 or 90 percent. What are the differences between that? And is there, is there a reason why such a large part of the, the, the UK water market had to be given up to, to others? Is that part of just the, the, the overall single market or was there another reason behind that? Um, I, I would check those figures because I think it's actually a bigger percentage that goes to, to Europe. Um, but I think the reasons for that were largely because um, the common I mean, grazing... It might be 60% to, to Europe and 40% to us. Um, yeah, but I think it was more to do with the common grazing aspect changing, um, you know, where more countries came on board and more countries needed to share. And, and this is kind of what's happened. But there's also undoubtedly an issue with flagship um, boats, which are well, which are posing as UK boats, I guess, um, and are UK boats, but are generally owned by Spanish owners or French owners, those types of things. Um, mm. So all in technically they're UK boats, but in, in a, a kind of practical implementation sense, the stocks and the quota are, are benefiting a country in the EU. So I, I saw a piece on France 24 when I was doing some research for this that showed there was a Dutch boat. Uh, which was having a, a bit of an altercation with a French boat, but the Dutch boat was carrying a UK flag. So yeah. th this mm -hmm. is to do with the, the selling of quotas and quota rights, is that correct? That's absolutely true. And to be fair, it's more of a problem um, down south in England than it is probably in Scotland. Um, okay. However, in Scotland, we have more of an issue with consolidation into a few hands um, so, so that's the kind of main difference. It's happening in the same way, but it's happening more with domestic um, companies. Okay, and I suppose one of the other things that came out of my research was that it suggested that the prior to the common fisheries policy, there were f far more boats and far more fishermen in Scotland than there are now. Whereas everything is now more consolidated into bigger boats that can bring on bigger tonnage. What kind of effect has that had on fishing communities? And is that something that you would think should be reversed or is it that just where we are now? No, I, I think it's had an absolutely devastating effect. Um, now, we'll be quite honest, we are happy for all types of scales of fishermen to, to, to do the best that they can and, and to progress. And that's fine. And there's a place for large scale, small scale and everything in between. Um, but I think 
the way domestic quota has actually been allocated has has led to a lot of um, the demise of our coastal communities, which is really sad. Um, what actually happened was quota belongs to the government, it belongs to the nation, um, yeah. as does licences for boats. Um, and a country like Norway will award those annually. Um, in a sense, and they'll try and do it in a fair way. The way uh, Norway does it is 60% or so goes to coastal communities, um, okay. their coastal fleet, and 40% goes to their super trawlers. Um, so that means that big business can do well, and it also means that coastal communities survive. We've taken a slightly different route. Um, when the quota was allocated, it was based on track record. Now, the track record system has been much disputed because some people didn't know that they were being monitored and what their track record would have been. Um, right. And so areas where they would have traditionally fished or stocks, they would have traditionally fished, fished but possibly hadn't been because of seasons, etc. cetera, um, they were kind of cut out of. Right. Um, the track record did, did not help and it kind of skewed who, who got what. Um, and on top of no, that... Never reviewed. No, that was never reviewed. And on top of that the bank did start to monetize quota so that people could lend against it and use it as an asset. Now, the understanding is it's always a national asset. It's always held by government. And there should not be any money attached to it other than what a fisherman is willing to barter for it. Um, but the situation is when the bank started lending against it, it was saw as an asset. Um, and so the price of, of quota and the price of licenses has, has now went up. Uh, um, way past the, the value of the boats in many cases. There's a market within there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's led to, to consolidation um, in, in bigger hands. And what it's also led to is some people will say, yeah, but some people sold off their quota, their licenses, so they can't complain about it. But we must remember that this system started in the 90s and there was a hell of a lot of young men and young women who weren't born there then yeah. uh, or, were, or were very young certainly we're not thinking about a career in the fishing quite yet um so it's disadvantaged generations coming up without a doubt okay um one of the other things that i found was that an awful lot of the fish which we uh, land in uh, from uk waters is sold straight back out to other countries because of british tastes is that correct yeah, that's absolutely true. Yep. Yeah, uh huh. It very much so it is uh, with the pelagic species, the mackerel and the herring. Yes, that's the case. And certainly with the shellfish, um, it, it's certainly the case as well. We find that there's more buoyant markets in the EU um, and uh, a growing market in areas like the Far East, but it's still in development. Okay. And would those markets in the Far East be, de be dependent upon free trade deals which are already signed as part of the EU or is that something that would have to be replaced in a, in a post-Brexit world? Well, I mean, I think most of the fishermen are, are trying to say that, the, the, well, I think certainly the SFF would say that the Far East is where the potential is. Mm -hmm. But I think the more prominent issue with the Far East uh, outside of trade deals is the fact that it's quite small in comparison to, to the European market at the moment. Yeah. Um, the European markets took about 30 years plus to build up. Um, if you can imagine the logistics and the relationship building, which has to happen in a, a more global sense, yeah. uh, we don't see it being able to replace the EU market straight away. No, not at all. Okay. And that's a big concern. Um, there was a, a piece of, that I saw where uh, a fisherman from down south, it wasn't, it wasn't a Scottish, Scottish market, was suggesting that in order to sell fish into France, they have to fill it in particular pieces of, of paperwork, etc. whereas sending those same fish down to England, there is no paperwork. But so is it the case that, that there is still an awful lot of uh, administrative effort that has to be done to sell into the, the single market anyway? Or was that kind of a, a bit of a misnomer? No, no, it's horrific. And it's something that we've been asking about for a long, long time. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our fishermen um, has to drive two and a half miles, uh, two, two, sorry, two and a half hours and two and a half hours back just to get slips to do exports um, to, to the EU, etc. Um, now, local authorities run this system. Some local authorities um, are very good. Some of them only open on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Um, <laughs> And the, um, Why am I not surprised? <laughs> and only for two hours <laughs> between, you know, two and four p.m. That's exactly how it is, and also they have a very variant pricing structure. I think our girl in Butts was something like about twenty-four pounds for for the certs, and they went up 
to over ninety pounds. Uh, with and, no and so how often do those need to be paid? Um, every time you have a, you have to send something out, basically. Every so you have to buy you have to buy dockets and certs to make sure that that um, the kind of providence of the, of the seafood is what it, what it is. So yeah, it's it can be very tricky if you're landing in a certain night and it has to be away quickly and you can't get your 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 documents to get it away. So right now it's not very practical. There should be an online system. Uh, mm-hmm. which anyone can access 24 hours a day, which you pay for a set rate and everyone knows what's happening. That would be the best way. Okay. So it's already pretty cumbersome. And if, if we were to come out completely of the single market uh, and then have to sell into these markets under a, under a different method, so, for example, if we were to do that under WTO rules, what would be the differences there and how much would that add into the, the process? I mean, the thing is, it's an unknown. I mean, we, right now, we don't think it's adequate. Now, there's going to be one or two things. We're either completely not going to be able to cope with it or it's it's going to offer a review of the process. My feeling is it would be good to have a review, but yeah. it's probably still going to be extremely complicated. So I don't see it improving a great deal in the next few months, no. <laughs> okay. So concerns over, over Brexit and over the next couple of months, I think you have you have a few... Yes, we do. We do. We do indeed. I mean, we, we, we try and look at it. We've, we've said since the beginning, we're constitutionally neutral and we're, we're politically neutral because we have members who have a range of different opinions and a range of different things. And we respect that. But mm-hmm. we see where we see some benefits to potential benefits to Brexit. We see certainly some, some downfalls, too. OK. Um, so the, the CFP is something which has been around for since the 70s. It's, it seems as though it hasn't really been reviewed very much at all. So coming out of, of uh, the EU and kind of almost forcing a review of, of the CFP, that would be at least one positive you would see, yes? Um, yeah, of course, that that is a positive because I think I'd said it might be the levels of access that might have been contentious for some people. Um, and yeah, I think a, a review of that was long overdue. But I think more importantly than that, the national conversation about domestic quota and allocation would never have happened without Brexit. OK. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not seeing that without the Brexit process starting. I'm not okay. seeing um, it's not directly linked as a domestic issue, but I don't see anyone anyone would have been brave enough to bring it up. And still now there's concerns about, about bringing it up. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose one other thing, do, do you think the quota system actually works at all? I mean, obviously, the the, the reasons behind it are, are laudable. You know, the idea being that you have a scientific study of the, the particular area, you decide how many fish are there and therefore how many fish you should be able to take out. Uh, but the, 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 the numbers are based on weight. They're not based on how many fish you catch. So the, it simply ends up with a bunch of dead fish being thrown back. How big a problem is that for the industry? What what does it really mean? And how much of throwing all this fish back just exacerbates the problem? There's a couple of ways to look at this. Um, we're talking about science and looking at how many fish are in certain areas and, and then basing decisions on that. That in itself has flaws because it really depends on which area you're in. Certain areas in Scotland will have far better scientific data than others. So sometimes you're still working with unknowns, um, particularly for non-quota species. So things like maybe scallops in the West Coast, it's difficult to actually even know what, what's out there. Um, so so that's, that's one of the factors. Um, the other factor is MSY. That can be quite variable. We've had certain years where we've had plus 40% uplift. The next Sorry, year... MSY, we're... did you say? Yeah, yeah, MSY, which is a kind of it's a maximum sustainable yield. What 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 you're recommended in terms of what you're able to fish um, to the maximum level. Um, so that but that can vary very wildly from year to year. For instance, one year we had a, a recommended forty percent uplift in nephrops. The next year was minus twenty seven or something, and then the next year was plus thirty seven. So it can be very variable in terms of of the science as well. Um, so. Fundamentally, I think most of our fishermen would prefer to work um, seasonally and, and to work with the stocks that are out there. It's, it's very difficult to go and catch something and throw it all back in the sea or now to land it, um, yeah. where it will not be used for human consumption, die straight over it and, and, and that's it, going to dump. 
Um, so it's it's a bit nonsensical and it's not using your resources to the best capacity as far as we're concerned. There should be a better way than this. Okay. And I presume, obviously, concerns will have been raised about that to the EU over over time. Has there been any indication that they, that they were amenable to a discussion on that? Or is it simply that this is too much effort to talk about? Yeah, I mean, no. Um, I think they were quite keen just to make sure that they implemented the, the, the discards ban and that was something that they were going to do. But I think the public probably don't understand quite what that means. What that mm. means, a fisherman actually has to, to take those fish and store them and ice them because if he doesn't, uh, what will happen is that his other catch will, will go off. He will take it on shore, it will be covered in dye, and then it will be, he will, the, the fisherman himself will pay the transport costs to go to a dump where it will just rot. So it just is such a hell of a wasteful process, and I think there's a far better way to do it. So rather than throwing it over the side, you're taking it home, storing it, spending energy to store it, and then dumping it and letting it rot. Yeah, and, and I think most fishermen would have even said, although they weren't happy about throwing anything over the side, um, they, they said at least it goes back into the ecosystem. Yeah, you know, it can buy other fish, so, you know. Yeah. Now we're just taking it out, um, costing a lot of money, and it's effectively just rotting, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And obviously, with the science changing so quickly, um, you know, we, we have real choke issues in certain areas around the coast. Um Sorry? What is, what's a choke issue? A choke issue is when there's a lot of fish that you maybe can't catch or you don't have quota for. So, for instance, in some areas around the coast, there's a lot of spur dogs that men can't catch or land, and it's actually becoming a safety issue because they're, they're quite heavy. Um, so spur dogs. If filling, spur dogs, yes. So if they're for filling the, up, it's, it's an issue for the men. For the, um, for the what is a spur dog? It, it it's like a kind of small type of sh it looks like a small shark in a sense and and there is a commercial market for it but we didn't have quota for that um so so they they're becoming a choke issue uh, you can't put your net in the water in some areas without them them filling the net and also it's the same for cod and whiting in some areas um in the northwest as well okay um so Something else I was going to ask. It was about the the, the quota issue and the, the fact that people can sell on their quotas to, to other other areas, etc. And one of the obviously biggest biggest concerns, supposedly from the Scottish Fishermen Federation, being about access to our waters. But if you look at the the size of the fishing fleet and the the size of the kind of fishing areas, would it be fair to say that if every other region or if every other nation was suddenly banned from being able to fish in Scotland's waters that we simply wouldn't have enough fishing capacity to, to bring on the quota that we have never mind any more. Yeah I mean like I said I think most sensible fishermen were never suggesting that everybody should be banned um, I think uh, I think there's reciprocal fishing rights although probably the UK or the Scotland benefits slightly less from from fishing in other countries I think, you know, there's relationships that have built up. Certainly we're very close to, to areas in Ireland and, and Norway, etc. So that, that that's that's actually historical rights which predate the, 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 the joining of the EU. Yeah. Um, and international rights as well, not just EU rights. So I guess everyone always understood practically that there'll be some access, but I think it was the terms of that access that they wanted to discuss. Um, in terms of our cap capability to, to catch the fish, I think with a little bit of careful planning, um, we could certainly make sure that we're able to do that in some time, you know, in, a few, in, in quite a few years. Not, not, it wouldn't take too long. No. I presume well, there have to be a ramping up of the, the onshore processing facilities and therefore presumably more jobs as a, as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I think we should be working towards that. I think we should certainly be working towards that as quickly as we can. But we've always said it wouldn't take an awful lot of investment in some areas to make sure that we could upscale the fleet. Um, because you say an awful lot. Can you give me an idea of figures of roughly? I presume that you've done some studies to say what what kind of level of investment would make a a step change, major difference. I mean, we're talking about um, boat building facilities, just to let you understand. Right mm -hmm. now, I've heard there's up to a five year waiting list for some of the boat yards in Scotland, and that's up in Macduff. Um, they, they're only really based more or less in the North East now. Uh, we, we don't really have many boat building facilities, and the, with a, a waiting list of five years, it would be incredibly difficult for anybody to, to try and commission a boat. Okay. Um, so, what we really need is somebody who's willing to build those boats. 
and that could happen quite quickly um but we just need to, and i would suggest that we should have that scattered around the coast rather than just a consolidation in any particular region mm -hmm. and so that would have to happen and it's not it's not beyond capability to, to to have that established within a couple of years um i would say in terms of uh, facilities it's fantastic that peterhead has a a, a, a nine uh, nine million pounds plant landing plant but what we are suggesting is that actually if you had facilities like ice and process fairly small processing plants around the coast um mm -hmm. that would make a massive difference for what um, various areas are able to kind of take in as well these we're not talking about massive investment here we're talking about just practical investment which would allow us to access um these stocks in a, a much more sensible and sustainable way as well so yeah it's possible within a couple of years i think certainly within five years okay um what are your biggest concern about the, the next couple of months in terms of the the fishing industry wow um i have a lot of concerns <laughs> i guess my my first concern is um assurance that fishing will not be battered un underneath this uh, financial framework deal which Mrs May had um, discussed on the 22nd of November where I think the assurance was that the EU partners would not be able to retract trade on a whim but also I'm concerned about that meaning a domestic um, jockeying situation annually between different sectors uh, and of course that could be quite destabilising for, for any sector as well as fishing. Um, I'm not quite sure what the outcomes of, of that will be. Mm -hmm. um, one of my biggest concerns is obviously getting our, our stocks to market. Um, frictionless trade is, is what most <laughs> a lot of sectors, including not only our own, are talking about. Our, our um, fleets are not massive. They can't take um, you know two-week delays, three-week delays, four-week delays. They might not be able to bear that. So yeah. I think with uh, congestion at borders, with direct action and with a combination of, of tariffs, that would be a concern. Um, competitive uh, ask, the, the paperwork that we mentioned earlier for selling into to France, etc., when it's already a, a, an EU country and in the, the single market, etc., versus sending into England, what, what difference would it make be in a post-Brexit world? Do you have any idea? how it, how it is for example selling to a third country is is it more paperwork than it is selling to france or is it kind of roughly the same well it really depends on what those deals are going to look like post brexit and what type of paperwork and uh, you're going to need i mean again that that's so a little bit hazy at the moment we don't have that detail in that but what we are saying is that you know if you have to have a massive delay at the borders on any of these products particularly perishables um it's going to be a massive problem uh, we are talking about maybe making air freights available, like at Presswick Airport. Um, but again, we have to be sure that the staff are, are up and able to handle the paperwork that's that's coming. We don't really know what that will look like. Um, so no, I, I, I'm not really assured. I don't feel comfortable at the moment that, that we're, we're quite ready for that. Um, so yeah, I think delays will be inevitable and I'm concerned about the impact they will have on our fleets. Okay. Um, there doesn't seem to be much clarity coming from the, the UK government just now on, on what's happening. Are you getting much assistance from the Scottish government? Are they, are they engaging in trying to help or are they kind of standing back going it's, it's their ball and they're the ones that are playing with it? No, I wouldn't say that. I'd say we're still waiting to see what the Scottish paper will say. Um, because that's going to be very important, particularly to the coastal fleets. Um, mm. What, what their, their paper in response to the white paper will, um, from DEFRA will, will really look like. Um, so hopefully that comes out soon and we have a bit more clarity about what we're looking at doing domestically um, because they may choose to do things slightly differently from, from south of the border. Um, so that will be immensely helpful. But no, I mean, the at civil servant level, Marine Scotland and DEFRA officials are working very, very hard, I think, and working together. Um, politics is a different thing, but I think the civil servants are doing all they can to, to try and have something workable. Okay, um, and I suppose obviously from from my perspective and from the, a lot of those kind of watching the the, the independence debate is a is a big thing still, um, and and kind of ongoing, and we're 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 due to be getting another independence referendum. Uh, does that just add more uncertainty? I mean, obviously, uncertainty just means decisions haven't been taken yet. But does that concern you that that, that there's going to be another independence referendum? Is it something where you think, well, actually, that could be a benefit to us? 
would would just going straight back into the EU be a concern for you as well? I know that's probably quite a lot to wrap up into one question, but what are your thoughts yeah, on that space? Fine. Well, like I said, we have a set of principles that we will alter, um, but effectively the principles are just the same. We would alter them for whichever constitutional arrangement we're in. But basically, the, the, the things that we would require would be the same in an independent Scotland, in or out Europe, in a, in a UK, in or out Europe. Yeah. These are basics. Um, so these basics should be applicable no matter what constitutional arrangement we're in. We're not politicians. We're not. The, yeah. We have never taken a stance o- on that. We don't think it's appropriate um, to do, to do so. We'll work within what the constitutional frameworks are. Uh, you, your, your concerns are the fish, the health of the fish stocks, getting it out of the water sustainably and getting it to plate quickly. Yeah, that's right. I mean, of course, if we went straight back into the EU. Um, it would really depend on the terms, but I guess uh, I mean, if you have to go back to that scenario that I was talking about, about um, fishermen texting in at quarter past three in the morning from Loch Inver when they're seeing all these vans moving to France, yeah. that would be an ideal situation for, for a lot of them. Um, so I guess it depends on the terms. It really yeah. depends on the terms. Um, but I think for a lot of coastal fishermen, it's the domestic port allocation and license system that really needs to be reviewed as well. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Elaine. I can't think of anything else that, that should really be uh, bringing up. If there, is there anything the, that you would really like to, to have as a message that, that comes out to, from your organisation, or is there anything that you've not had a chance to kind of say yet? There actually is. Um, when when I was in Norway, um, I, I, I can't praise enough their system. Their system is miles ahead. It's egalitarian. It's fair. They do the best they can to ensure that business succeeds at all levels and that communities survive and that sustainability and science is accurate and sensible. Um, If we could find our way to being something like Norway, we would be miles ahead of where we are now. Um, What I would say is they have one less massive impediment that we have, um, which is mandates and who's speaking for who and how are they all funded. Now, we've talked about the SFF, and certainly the SFF are, are valid in representing some of the bigger interests and, and are very well resourced and, uh, and are doing their job. So, in a sense, you cannot complain that they're standing up for their members' interests. We just yeah. have different interests and they don't speak for, for us in general. So, you know, we wouldn't criticise them for doing their job, I guess. The only thing I would say is I wish that we could have maybe taken more of a constitutionally neutral position and that we could have possibly worked for the best of all fleets. But that's not happened. So that's fine. So we have CIFA and we're developing ourselves through that. Um, what I would say is that we have to be careful at the other end of the spectrum, too, because we do have certain organisations who are speaking as national federations who we believe are funded externally to fishing entirely. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of money coming in to these bodies who we feel probably don't represent very many people. And I guess, I guess a part, part and word would be fishing needs cleaned up fishing policy needs cleaned up and it needs it just make people accountable if you're a genuine fisherman association you've got nothing to worry about with that that's that's my key thing if we want to get to somewhere like norway we have to be cleaning out the house so. thank you very much for joining me today elaine that's been wonderful thank you so much for taking the time uh thanks for your help listen anytime phone me anytime